<laughs> no applause, so first, and thank you for the introduction. Um, I start with this mandatory slide about the Front Over Society for those of you who don't know who we are. So we are doing a lot of research and mostly the applied research. So the purpose of this slide is not so much to impress you with some numbers on the budget or whatever. So there's two purposes. First, to show where Silmen are, because it's, uh, it's in a down loop. Well, it's just in the middle of Germany. And the second purpose is uh, to tell something about our budgeting, because it has uh, influence on what we can do, what we ca cannot do. So basically, we do not have so much basic funding, and we have to do a lot of industry projects. And it has uh, amplification of uh, how our work then looks at the end, like in my project, in my group, for instance, it's about the half of the things, even a bit more of that what we do for the industry. Um, so our building looks like so we are about 160 people in, in Ilmenor, and we have the uh, branch lab in Oldenburg uh, with different uh, business units. So once again, maybe you see how do we think we think in business units, so not, not much in the chair of particular topics, so it's more market oriented. And in our business units, we do the media management and delivery. So to break it to the, what we actually do is we do a lot of uh, digital signal processing. We do a lot of uh, machine learning. But with some, some uh, important details on uh, security and privacy and uh, with a lot of skills that we, do, we need to do that job. Uh, in my group, so we are, we are doing <clears throat> basically the same, but for audio, and there are a lot of that in there um, applied to music, with two main focuses where we earn now money is in the audio matching, so audio fingerprinting, and uh, the automatic extraction of information from music. So we are kind of quite small, but not so small group, so with students we are maybe something like 15 people, or in average, Plus minus. So the motivation why we are all here, we have the archive. To be truthful, I've never been to the music archive, but I imagine it looks something like that. <laughs> you have a lot of recordings, and uh, <clears throat> uh, the amount of this data is just so huge that you need some tools to, to find the, the things that you look for in, in that archive. And one of the possible solutions is uh, to apply the content-based music information retrieval and to learn from the audio content that you have, the audio content that you have with annotations, and maybe also to learn from the audio content that you have without annotations available, and to apply that to make the life easier. Um, uh, I had a bit of problem to pick up something for 25 minutes, or so choose like three applications what I think are relevant uh, uh, for archives in general, and I think also for the ethnomusicology uh, archives. So I will look through these um, examples, application examples, and conclude a little bit with challenges, best, best practices. Um, so this problem basically exists not just for the archives. This problem exists also for the uh, music collections in general. And uh, the reason of me bringing this slide now is like, uh, because the expectation of the user is much influenced by the market. And their user nowadays is, uh, is using all the music services. And I think it's also the, the shift in the expectation, what can be expected from the archives at some point, because you know all is available, all can be streamed, I can browse through, I can share, on whatever, whatever. So um, from some, some point, we can kind of take a look, maybe some of the ideas, and the other point, uh, the technical uh, implementation of, of uh, things that we suggest or propose the user is kind of high, really high quality. So what we do in terms of uh, automatic music annotation, uh, we extract the uh, different types of semantic information from music. Uh, we're a bit industry driven, so we do it mostly for the mainstream music, although we have some projects that are maybe going more in, this, in, the, in the direction of what you're doing. 
Uh, the idea is, but it's the same. You try to extract the data. Uh, they automatically extract the data from the content. It means from really waveform with the waveform and the, and the samples of the of the audio. And you try to use this, for instance, for the recommendation to finding things that are similar, to finding things that are matching to some other stuff, and are, and are one of the things what Emmanuel was, was talking about today is music transcription, uh, because it also opens a lot of uh, application possibilities uh, for how the content can be used, reused, or uh, accessed, and so on. Oh, in one of the one of the things that you maybe know from your cell phone is this query by humming, where you sing the some melody line, and their and their algorithm takes a look in the database uh, if there is something similar to that. It works to some extent uh, for for popular music, quite good. Uh, maybe it could be one of the interfaces to your archives as well. Um, you also can use it in the education or. One of the, uh, of the applications, what we are also following is a plagiarism detection, just opens the possibilities. To do so, to develop such methods, you basically need two building blocks. One is uh, digital signal processing, uh, so really taking a look with some time frequency transformations, what is going on in your signal, and uh, extract some features, so some descriptors from, from your data, and then apply the machine learning and then see how can you get the, some useful information out of that. So, so it, look, it can look like that for the data scientists uh, within ours, nothing new. You have some training data, you extract some features, you, you do maybe some feature selection or dimensionality reduction, you, you learn the model, and then you can apply it to, to some evaluation data or, or at the end to some of the new unseen data. So I was quite inspired yesterday about the, uh, uh, the you know, boxes with the boss, so I decided to, to show you one example, uh, how it could look like. Imagine you have a collection of some music, it's from some older project, but um, doesn't matter for, 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 for now. So you're, um, you want to investigate music styles, and you got some uh, bass patterns or in the MIDI format, and you want to just to see if you can classify uh, music styles with that. Uh, so what is happening? First, you have to think what are the features that could be useful f for solving this task. What does mean useful? So one of the useful things, if uh, some features are having some typical values for particular styles and are and, uh, having different values for some other styles. So you can think of that, for instance, you can take a look to the tempo in bits per minute and see, okay, so how does it look like for, for my styles? And then you see, okay, they're hip hop, minimal techno. I can distinguish somehow already with one feature. For the rest, it's maybe not enough, and uh, then you end up with maybe having two features. Uh, in real life, it's even more and more. And at some point, but not so nice for the plotting on the slides, so imagine you have some feature space then you can um, represent each of your uh, bars, patterns, or bus lines as one point uh, in this feature space. So then the machine learning comes into the game and uh, helps you to get useful information out of that. So for instance, you see, okay, these different colors represent different styles, so somehow there are some clouds uh, there, so some places of, their, of the feature space are more typical for some of the uh, styles than the others. And that's the good news. It means that your features are bringing the information already with them. And uh, then you can ask machine learning and uh, either the generative or discriminative, either to learn the distribution of the features in this feature space or to learn the borders, some borders in this feature space. And then you can use those models for the classification. And uh, uh, what is good about that, I mean, you can, of course, here I have a small example, you can imagine building some decision tree and setting some thresholds and uh, saying, okay, I can put this and that borders and uh, I can then classify my styles, but you can ask the machine to do that for you. And if the feature space is high dimensional, you have a lot of data, it can make your life a bit easier. 
So this way it works, and we have for, for musical notation recommendation, uh, we have a product that's called Sounds Like, oriented towards more towards the um, uh, mainstream music, basically extracting different parameters from, from the music um, on, the, on a track level and uh, allowing the, uh, the, ser the search and recommendation um, of music. We also have some uh, tools in, uh, towards the music transcription, uh, nothing so fancy with 20 cent resolution, so we are more on a, on a classic or a usual scale. But uh, some ideas could be, for instance, one of the applications we have is called Songs to See, and it's uh, for uh, music edutainment, so kind of having their, their computer-like game uh, for to learn the real music instruments, so without the, uh, instead of using the Guitar Hero uh, console, like the, uh, the tool, you can use your real instrument and their system measures what tone you play and what tone you're supposed to play, compares that and give you, and give you the score. And for doing that, uh, we also have the editor that basically does the transcription. So you can try it, it's, or you can take the demo version from, from our web page um, and take a look how it works. So it's basically extracting the, the main information from the music track and it has also some source separation there so they can put down the main melody and uh, save the backing track and something like that. So it could be useful for some applications as well. Um, one more thing what we, what we are doing is speech music discrimination, so, so speech music detection, uh, music detection, um, the scope uh, uh, where we are most, ac or have been most active last year is the broadcast, but could be interesting for the archives as well. Also in the field recordings you have some speech, and we have seen some, uh, some, some examples today. Um, so for the broadcast, it was more for the collecting society reporting, because all music that is played has to be reported, and there, there we are. Uh, we have been working together with GEMA and also with public broadcasters and then private broadcasters, mostly in Germany, and, uh, and got it also deployed at ID Sternpunkt, basically the place where the public broadcasting signal is leaving the earth towards their space. And they're, and they're helping the colleagues there now to report, to do the, to do the music reporting, to give more and more precise way. Um, other story what I wanted to, to tell today is the audio matching. We had a talk yesterday already on um, like explaining how it could help to clean up the metadata. I would like to, to follow that uh, as well. So basically, in the audio matching, uh, you don't do the similarity search anymore. You want to recognize the particular recording. So exactly this single recording. And uh, you know such solutions maybe from YouTube, you know that uh, if you try to upload some uh, well-known song to the YouTube, probably it will be rejected because YouTube is just checking if there are some uh, copyright holders that are against of you uploading some uh, <laughs> important music on your, on your channel. And uh, we are working on in audio fingerprinting since years, so it's basically um, uh, the idea is you extract the fingerprints uh, with some suitable features and then, then you create a database with these fingerprints and you can match and, and see um, if uh, the audio is in the database. It can be used for content identification, classically, also for TV or radio monitoring, but it also can be used for uh, deduplication, repository cleanup, because uh, you have sometimes also unintentionally the same recording several times in, a data, in, in your archive, and you don't want that. You basically want, uh, don't want that the size of the archive is exploding, and uh, or you maybe want to see if some parts it's more relevant for, for broadcasting and, and production, but sometimes some content is reused, or you know there is the whole recording, then there is a cut recording, and you want to, to build a relation between those. Uh, in this case, uh, this technology can also be helpful. Um, sometimes people make a difference between the matching and the segment matching. Uh, so mostly it's about 
if if the if the size of the query is uh, uh, arbitrary or not, and uh, if you're analyzing the archive and you want basically to compare each recording to the each recording, then you are more in the segment matching case because you don't know how long is your query, and uh, the reuse of some segment can be of different lengths in in some other in in some other recording. Just for the clear clarification of the terms. So we are working on the on the fingerprinting quite a lot already, starting back in 2000 and uh, um, um, moving that forward and forward again. So unfortunately, I don't have a successful reference project in the archiving. Maybe I will get one after this symposium. But uh, um, that's where I brought you some other. Um, so, so we started really in early uh, years. In the 2004, we had a first public demo. And it was in, in Munich, there was such a booth, people could enter it and sing something and, uh, um, um, and, and use that. Um, and now we are having, uh, since some years, we're working together with JFK Telecontrol and doing the audience measurement uh, for TV and, and also for radio. And uh, um, it sounds a bit strange, but actually we measure by, by sound what people watch in a TV. But it works really, really good. So the idea is you capture the, the sound and you compare that to the database with the TV channels. And it works quite, quite good. It's good accepted in several countries, including the Germany. Uh, for, the, for the radio audience measurement, the task is becoming a little bit more complicated because it's done with uh, mobile recording devices. And uh, uh, for instance, uh, like 30% of the radio consumption is within the car. And in the car, the acoustic conditions are not that friendly for their digital signal processing. And uh, we have to be a bit flexible what is fingerprint and how does it work. So uh, up to a minus 15 uh, dBA of, of signal to noise ratio. So it's even if the signal is much, uh, if, if the noise is much more loud, then it still has to work. So those are our experiences in that. Um, um, in that field, and uh, one more, um, what I included uh, in my talk today, it's about the quality control, and uh, that is maybe one of the um, uh, like uh, fields that doesn't get enough attention, and I think there uh, one can also uh, gain some information with digital signal processing and, and machine learning. Uh, so I brought you some possibilities now are here for quality control. So what we do, uh, what we have, for instance, is their uh, so-called inverse decoder. It's basically uh, tracking the, the coding traces. Once you have the wave file, you, you encode that as MP3, or you maybe decode it once again. And that happens in the archives as well. And then you maybe, maybe decode it uh, back as a wave. Uh, you have on the signal level, you have the code, codec uh, traces within the signal. And we can detect those and we can, we can say for, for the wave file if it was ever uh, decoded and encoded and if then with which of the codecs, it could be quite useful. We do that for forensics application, but it can also be done for the quality control um, or for editing detection, just to, to know if there is some editing, if something was cut of the file or, or maybe not. Um, what we also have is our micro, micro, microphone classification, and that I think it also could be um, interesting for the field recordings if you can automatically recognize, okay, which recordings have been done with the same microphone, because it could be just useful. You, you can give you a hint, maybe it was the same person doing that, the same equipment, and uh, you can maybe group these recordings at some point. Um, and there are this NFF, uh, ENF and stable tone analysis are, is comparing the, uh, the, like the 50 hertz harm to the, uh, that we have in, in our network or 60 hertz harm in, in the American network to that what is in the recordings and with that you can also do the analysis that is useful. Um, and if you even think further, if you, for instance, can uh, understand uh, which file is related to, to the other file by 
uh, decoding or encoding, you can build such a tree, like a family history tree, and say, okay, uh, like I have a small picture here, so they, like that was the original file, then it was once decoded, and then or it was maybe cut, and, and then the part was decoded once again. And uh, with this phylogeny analysis, you can build such a tree, and it can help you, for instance, to, uh, uh, to say, okay, what is, the most, what is the highest quality I have in the archive? And then you probably want to uh, keep the grandmother and their, all that, or further for us, um, not so interesting for you. So, is that what we do? And of course, it's not that everything is solved and done, so there is a lot of, a lot of stuff to go. And one of that is, um, um, I didn't get, I didn't even try to find a good example in our ethnomusicology because it probably would sound funny for you. So, it's quite often that to solve some task, you have to apply different extractors. So it's not just enough to detect the beats, you also want to detect the chords, and you want to, so it's, it's a really a multiple extractors that you have to run. And uh, then we have been discussing yesterday in a workshop quite a lot about the, for instance, how the country was called once or, or whatever. So you have all this semantic information. And, and that's example from some other project, but I think you will get the idea. You want that uh, the user should be able to retrieve the information in a natural way. And the user is asking, retrieve video shots in which the uh, US politician mentions a European country. So it's something that is uh, easily understandable by, by the human, but uh, for the machine, hmm, you need to translate that and split that to the requests uh, that can be done. You can, for instance, if it's video, you can make it some face detection recognition. If you have the audio signal, do the speaker recognition. Then you have the speech to text. Then you have to find by this named entity recognition, for example, some names of the European countries. Then you have to know which country is a European country and that uh, Mr. Obama is uh, the former US president and the uh, US politician and so on. So you have a lot of information over there and you have to combine that information and you have to be able to query that information. So it's um, one of the fields where it's a lot of work also, uh, a lot of work is done currently, but um, it's an important point that sometimes is left behind because everyone is fond of working on the perfect extractor and, uh, and this you know, boring thing is left behind, but it's really important. Um, so from the best practice, uh, uh, what we experience is uh, that so the main task of the data scientists is of course to get, learn so much as possible about the data. So first data as soon as possible, learn uh, what is inside the data, learn the, the, the data variability. And uh, one of the things that machine learning has to rely on are the expert annotations. You have to know what is the quality of the expert annotation. Are those comparable? Are there some experts coming from some other region giving other annotations and so on? It's, it's also a lot about semantic and how to call what and, uh, and how, how, um, how well consents are the annotation. And uh, um, it's like that, that, that um, this application are most not perfect. So uh, every time it's, it's early machine learning application, there will be an example that is not working. So you have to do a lot of explanation uh, to understand by yourself why this example is not working and to, to also to explain that to the user why exactly this is not working and how to improve that. So that's a lot of things to do there. And the takeaway message for today, I would like to say that in general it's possible to extract the metadata from the audio material from the waveform and it enables the uh, retrieval and, uh, of huge data collections and these new solutions can be used for search, for identification, management, recommendation, retrieval. So it's a lot of applications. And uh, one of the things we need to know to do is uh, first learn how to deal with not non-perfect extractions, non-perfect information, still to be able to gain uh, and to, to get added value on that. And one of the possibilities you have to link all available information starting from the expert knowledge, cross-model annotations, context, usage, and their up to now, the, the best working solutions are still hybrid 
combining the information of the experts, doing maybe some pre-filtering by the available annotations, available metadata, and then applying to the, the automatic extraction methods brings the best results. I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.